At its very core, drug science must remain independent. This means we don't accept sponsorships. It's with the support of the drug science community we're able to do this and make the podcast in the first place. If you're able to become a drug science community member and support the show, you too will be supporting the dissemination of evidence-based drug policies. Without you, none of this would be possible. For anybody interested, there's a link in the show notes. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Drug Science Podcast with me, David Nutt. Here we're bringing together experts and activists for a rational, honest and informed conversation about drugs. A Fascinate Productions podcast for drug science. The subject of today's podcast is chemsex. The term chemsex generally refers to the intentional use of substances, specifically crystal meth, methadrone and GHB or GBL, in the context of sexual encounters amongst men who have sex with men, or MSM. In much of the research to date, chemsex typically refers to sex involving multiple partners and the use of apps to facilitate hookups, such as Grindr, Gaydar or Scruff. To take us through this really interesting and somewhat controversial area, we have two lecturers, one in law, and that's Alex Dimmock from Goldsmiths College. Hello, Alex. Hiya. And uh, one in criminology, who is Leah Moyle from Royal Holloway. Hello. And they have just done a remarkable study on chemsex, getting people to tell them why they take drugs during sex and what uh, impact that has on the sex and the rest of their lives. It's been funded by the Wellcome Trust and it addresses what is seen by many people as a very uh, worrying and uh, rising trend. One thing their research has discovered is that people who use drugs for sex are often very concerned about harm reduction and they will share with us some fascinating insights into how to do that. The interview, I think you will discover, gives a very broad and sensible, balanced view of the whole topic. So uh, I hope you enjoy it. And, uh, of course, if you do, make sure you subscribe to the show, tell your friends about it, follow us on Twitter, and on with the show. So who's going to start off? Which is going to start off by telling us why you got interested in this topic and, and, and what you actually did? I can start. So I was at Royal Holloway until September last year and Leah and I uh, started around the same time, became friends, wanted to work together on something. And my background to that point, I hadn't actually researched drugs before, but I had researched sexual subcultures, in lots of detail, things like kink subcultures. I'd done lots of work on pornography. And at the time, there was the beginnings of the outcry around chemsex. And when this sort of phenomenon emerged, particularly when the, the Vice documentary came out on chemsex, we saw an opportunity really to potentially intervene into that discourse, that conversation, and do something a bit different. So people are using these drugs in combination to facilitate or alter sexual experiences? Yeah, absolutely. So they I suppose the fear around chemsex has really been sort of focused upon some of the parties that have been related to chemsex. So we've had stories of individuals who've become addicted to the substances, who've engaged in sort of weekend long parties. And there's been a lot of fear, I suppose, from the media and policymakers around that. And I think one of the things to say is the majority of that anxiety has been centred on men who have sex with men, Mm -hmm. gay and bisexual men, and specifically in particular boroughs in London. So one of the areas that is problematic when we start looking at the chemsex research that's been done to date is that all of it is based in urban locations. We don't know very much about what goes on outside of big cities, really. So, yeah, the majority of research has been focused on men, and that was one of the things that, in our research, we wanted to go beyond that population and think about sex and drugs in a more holistic way rather than as a public policy phenomenon or right. crisis. So rather than sort of getting on the scaremongering bandwagon that, that everyone's going to get AIDS again because <laughs> we're injecting methadrone, you, started, mm-hmm. you wanted to have a broader perspective. Absolutely. And you raised money from the Wellcome Trust to, to do a study. Tell us about the study. How did it work? So with the study, we decided that we wanted to combine what's called virtual ethnography and also in-depth interviews. So we were really interested in people's personal experiences. Um, I think 
what's common with drugs research is focusing on risk and sort of um, harm. We were very interested in in kind of opening up the debate and actually hearing more about pleasure. Mm. I think as drugs researchers... Really, we- lawyers aren't supposed to be interested in pleasure. <laughs> lawyers are often very interested in pleasure, probably too interested in some cases. Sorry, sorry. Get back on, back on track, right? So, that's- <laughs> <laughs> so I think for us, what was going to be really interesting was to hear about how people used these drugs for enhancement and for sensation. And as drugs researchers, I think because of pressure for policy impact and also funding, we tend to focus upon research which is framed around around risk. Um, so really, we wanted to tap into those experiences around pleasure. So how did you get the people to interview to be honest, mainly through Twitter. Um, we set up a Twitter account for the project pretty early on. So the first part of the project was actually historical. and We were trying to sort of contextualise the contemporary findings that we then mm. went out to look for. And we were posting about, we just put out a call for participants and got a, a huge number of responses just sort of through so Twitter. So what was the hashtag? Sex and drugs? <laughs> Probably. I'm not surprised you got <laughs> Can't remember. But I think we were asked to be recruited. We were recruited through Blue Light, actually. So what do you actually do? So you ask, you ask people to come and talk to you. Yeah. Uh, as a drugs researcher, I know that people are very happy to talk about their drug use experiences. Yeah. But I have to say, I, I was concerned as to whether we would get a good uptake for people talking about both of those areas. But what we actually found was that people were really keen to talk about their sex and drug use experiences. We had people say to us, you know, I talk to my friends about sex, I talk to my friends about my drug use, but it doesn't seem to be that, that I'll, I'll talk to them about those combinations together. So was there a sense in which people kind of had things they wanted to get off their chest or they wanted to kind yeah. of share with others because they were confused or worried or, or was it that they were wanted to sort of proselytise and get people out there enthused? Or, you know, how, or was it a mixture of both? So we had people say to us that they found it a very cathartic experience yeah. to sort of make sense of their sex and drug use. The interview was an experience where they could actually talk through their journey, as it were, on sex on drugs. And I think they found that quite valuable. I think lots of people found it a good opportunity, really, to reflect on yeah. lots of drugs. Quite often people talked about experiences mm-hmm. that they said they'd completely forgotten about and it sort of brought back to them. Yeah. And then they sort of set that in context with their sort of broader use of drugs or their broader sexual experiences. Was it, I mean, to what extent was it people saying, I've got problems? Because, you know, obviously, I'm a, I'm a psychiatrist, I, you know, when I've come <laughs> across this, it's people who say, I can't stop doing the things mm. I, I don't want to do because of sex and because of drugs. But for your interview, is when it was more about sharing the, the positives rather than the, the compulsion. I mean, we didn't get any interviewees who would say that they had dependent use oh, okay. now. We had a couple of interviewees who talked about... You know, they did talk about different, certainly talked about difficult experiences and they certainly talked about unpleasant experiences, but it wasn't because they felt they had a substance dependency issue. One of the fears about chemsex is it's going to resurrect a whole new generation of, of people getting addicted to either to basically cocaine or methadone, you know, stimulants or sedatives like GHB. But you don't, is that something that you saw or you're worried about in your research or, or can we put that to bed? I mean, one of the things that did come up, a couple of participants said, you know, I got so used to partying all weekend, Mm. so used to having sex with my long-term partner, actually, using chems. Mm -hmm. I did find sex sober quite difficult for various reasons. So we had quite a few people talking about that, but it wasn't Mm. that they had dependency on the chemicals. It was more that they struggled to re-establish what sober sex meant to them, I guess. Yeah, I think... There were definitely participants who related sex on drugs as kind of peak sexual experience. Mm-hmm. So for them, it was it was how do I reconcile that with everyday sex? Mm-hmm. So some of them talked about the disappointment of going back to day to day sex after having potentially quite a transformative mm. experience. Mm. We'll get back to the interview in just a second. I just want to thank all the drug science community members for your continued support. Without you, the dissemination of information like this would not be possible. Drug science is, and always will be, independent. This means we don't accept sponsorships. But by becoming a drug science community member, you'll be helping us bring about change. You'll also receive access to exclusive events and will be able to attend all drug science events for free. To see how to become a community member, click on the link in the show notes. Now, where were we? Let's get back to the show. (laughs) 
this kind of reminds me, you know, 30, 40 years ago the, with, with the rise of homosexual sex in, in San Francisco, for instance, a lot of, well, fueled may be the right word, you know, the energised well, the weekends of, of sex in bathhouses. Mm-hmm. And that, well, that was driven by cocaine and, and the ability, to, you know, cocaine to, or methamphetamine mm-hmm. to keep you going. Mm-hmm. Is that part of what we are seeing today with methadrone? I mean, giving you I, energy and drive and persistence. To be honest, methadone wasn't one of the drugs that really came up in really? our study. And I think this is because we, I mean, we, the, most of our participants, and this may be because we're women, I don't know, but um, the majority of our participants were not men of sex with men. Right. Um, the majority, I mean, the men we interviewed, we interviewed, I think, how many was it? 17, 16 women, 15 men in total, anything from age 22 to 60. Majority, I'd say, were not straightforwardly heterosexual. I think that's fair. Quite interestingly, a lot of our um, sample population described themselves as heteroflexible, yeah. which which was interesting it in was. itself. So you better explain what that is. That a scientific <laughs> term or is it a colloquial term? <laughs> so essentially, they you know they were open to explorative yeah. encounters right. across sexual mm. orientation. Right. Really. And quite a lot said that particularly when they were high, they were more likely to experiment. Mm you know, one way or the other, um, with the gender that they didn't usually have sex with. So was there a sense in which some of them were using drugs to allow them to express something that they couldn't express otherwise? Is that, was that an interpretation? I think that's a good interpretation of a lot of our data, actually. For some people, it was about disinhibition, yeah. where there might have been sexual issues in their lives otherwise that had stopped them from doing what they really wanted to do, or they had certain personal taboos around mm-hmm. sex that you know perhaps sometimes mm. drugs help them break down mm. um so quite a few of those sorts of experiences mm. we were kind of captured in the data just to come back to your initial question like methadone just wasn't one of the drugs that came up much well maybe maybe but, it's yeah. not being used so much you know that maybe the the fear has or, or the you know the, well i think i mean the concern was going to be a spike of hiv as a result of injecting mm-hmm. methadone a few years ago maybe that hasn't been realized which is great so what were the drugs that you found were most commonly used then So interestingly, MDMA was at the top of the list, really, in terms of prevalence. Um, And I think what's quite interesting about MDMA is we associate it with its pro-social effects, Mm -hmm. um, you know, connection, um, emotional bonds, all of those sorts of things, um, heightened empathy. You know, that did come across in our interviews, um, particularly with couples who talked about the ability to engage in relationship work um, under the influence of, of ecstasy. So that's something that the Shulgans talked about with the rediscovery of MDMA. Um, and they talked about the potential for MDMA for relationship work and a sort of feeling of untenseness, as it was put in some of their um, reports. Um, so we did see a lot of that. But actually, what was more interesting to us was the potential for MDMA to be used for pleasure. Um, mm-hmm. So we had respondents who talk to us about how MDMA could increase sense of uh, desire, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, Participants in the BDSM community as well talked about the uh, capacity for MDMA to actually transform the nature of pain into pleasurable feelings um, in those kind of sex party contexts. Mm -hmm. And also, I think, because there is a sense that MDMA has a effect on the ability to orgasm. Actually, it it made for more explorative encounters in sex. So people talked about becoming more adventurous in their sex because lives. Because it delayed orgasm, so they could do. Yeah, more. so so they ended up, you know, um, engaging in different acts, um, you know, different styles of sex, and for them, they they felt that was you know really gratifying. Do you know what doses they were using? Is there any sort of comment you can make on what, what the optimal dose might be? Because I hope it's low. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of our respondents were recreational users of MDMA. So they would talk about, you know, using those drugs in the context of raves or festivals and then going on to have sex. But many of those participants then learnt to enjoy those effects and then plan to use this combination of MDMA with sex in the, in the future with partners. And the dose would be... You know, an average dose, really. They were they weren't kind of overdoing it. Yeah, I mean, it's an, yeah, obviously this, that's one of the big problems, knowing what the dose is. And mm. I mean, you didn't come across people who had adverse effects. Not really. I mean, this is a self-selecting sample at the end of the day. Yes, so yes. I do think the fact that because they, they tended to be enthusiastic drug users, they mm. tended mm. to be quite risk averse actually around dosage in particular. 
Well, let's talk about G then now and come okay. back. So right. it was gamma hydroxybutyrate. So yeah, this was a drug that wasn't, I mean, about a third of our participants used it mm-hmm. out of us, our 31. Quite interestingly, more women than men in mm-hmm. the sample used it, which is kind of interesting because there's, you know, the narrative around GHB in women is that it is simply a date rape drug Absolutely. used to, you know, knock people out and then ex- exploit them, essentially. Yeah, exactly. yeah. And in our study, there were quite a lot of participants who specifically, we asked them about G to find out beyond whether or not they'd used it, what their, their feelings were about it. And a lot of mm-hmm. people said, actually, I've seen my friend use it and it really put me off. Yeah. So that came up quite a lot. But for those people who did use, it was particularly about the disinhibition. In particular, we had some really interesting comments from women about how... There are so many sort of sexual expectations placed yeah. on women and they found that G was the drug that made them so disinhibited they were able to ask for exactly what they wanted and they cared far less about their partner's pleasure when oh. on G than, than they ordinarily would. Perhaps not great for the partner, but... Um, well, as long as they're taking the G <laughs> voluntarily, I guess. Certainly, yeah. I mean, they absolutely were, were particularly, again, the, this sort of risk management around G was mm. something that really came up strongly in our... Mm study particularly people talked about um how reluctant they were actually to give their friends g who they didn't feel were going to be responsible with it or that couldn't be trusted with to take it themselves down the line some of the participants talked about within their sort of group of friends writing harm reduction guides that they would distribute before they'd even allow their friends access to it yeah really really careful cautious 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 around it because as we know the line between dose and overdose is so Thin. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there was there was quite a lot of chat around, you know, how people managed the level of dose. Where there were watchers, observers, uh, people had WhatsApp groups, for example, where they would write down when they took, how much they took. Uh, one participant talked about how going to you went to sex parties, you'd end up at the end of the night seeing a load of people with permanent marker. Um, all down their arm when they'd written down the dosage and the time and oh, so on. Is that right? They, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Huh? And it's in permanent markers that, you know, it doesn't rub off if they go. Very sophisticated harm reduction. <laughs> Very sophisticated yeah. harm reduction. But I do think that's what's needed around G well, I, I would agree strategies. with it. But we could talk about that. There are two things I wanted to talk about then on, in, in that context. So what proportion of, of your sample were were they all sex party goers? For, for ease, you know, to tell the story with the data, really, what we did was split up our participants into broad categories. Mm-hmm. So we had four categories which we used to kind of classify the types of sex on, on drug mm-hmm. use that they engaged in. So the first category was um, individuals who um, engaged in sex on drugs in sex parties. So mm-hmm. this could be um, organised sex parties in the, night, in the context of a nighttime economy. Mm -hmm. Um, But it could also be private sex parties that could be spontaneous or Mm organised. We also had a group that we understood as psychonauts. Mm -hmm. Um, So these were the types of participants who were more likely to engage in research on dose. Mm -hmm. They were the participants who were more likely to use these Reddit forums, Mm Arrowids, Blue Light, in Mm -hmm. order to you know, look at these experiences, um, you know, of other people who've combined sex on certain drugs, they were more likely to experiment with dose, um, you know, to engender different types of enhancements Mm -hmm. and sensory experiences. Um, We also had a category of chemsex, um, which, you know, again, relates to this use of GHB, methadrone and crystal methamphetamine. Um, But it's important to note that actually we only had one participant who identified as um, engaging in this particular um, cultural form of drug use. And then finally, interestingly, recreational drug users were the largest proportion Mm. of our participants. So... What we tended, what we tended to hear was, um, you know, recreational drug users had um, unintentionally combined sex on drugs. So we might be thinking of an MDMA user who'd gone to a festival or gone to, you know, a club night and had ended up having a sexual encounter. They'd enjoy those effects, and then they'd planned to actually, you know, continue using this this combination in the future. It's important to say though that. You know, we didn't understand these categories as being fixed. Um, some people uh, fitted into more than one category and, and some of them transitioned into these mm. d- different categories. But I think what's important is to just really highlight the diversity of 
people who are involved in sex on drugs, you know, this yeah. far exceeds um, this category, this fixed category of chemsex. So you can't just say, oh, sex on drugs is bad, chemsex is bad, because people are using it different ways for different purposes. Absolutely. And some of them are actually being quite sophisticated in the way they, they think about it and the way yeah. they protect themselves. Yeah. I mean, there was one participant, I think, who I would describe initially as a psychonaut who happened upon a combination with a group of friends who would he would sort of organize these private sex parties mm -hmm. and they basically just trialed various combinations until they hit upon the one that they really liked and it was quite an unusual when it was ghb with 2cb and nitrous and that was what they then used in a very regimented nitrous way nitric? nitrous the, nitrous the, the balloon yes okay. yeah balloon sorry um and they would just and they would mm -hmm. use this in a very regimented way actually at all their private parties the sort of management around this stuff That's in itself was quite interesting. <laughs> well, yeah. But, you know, no alcohol, in the, very strict, no alcohol in the house, you know. No, well, you know. I wanted to talk to you about alcohol because, I mean, most people's experience of, of sex on drugs would be alcohol. I guess it, it's the drug that most people use to disinhibit them they, for the first time they have sex. <laughs> and uh, it, did, Does that figure at all? Or is it that everyone is kind of moved away from alcohol now? One of the things that came up in interview that I found really interesting was you know, when you talk to people about G and the kind of panic around chemsex, the first thing they'd say is, well, why don't people care about alcohol? And all these women mm. being, you know, yeah. exploited and, yeah. uh, you know, spiked and so on. Why do they care about that when people do this every weekend and get completely intoxicated and can't consent? Yeah. And that was one reaction that came out again and again and again in interviews, actually, when we talked about what well, we discussed with the participants, some of the rhetoric around chemsex and particularly G. Yes, I mean it's it's the whole issue of G is is, is I mean I've been around since it started being used and mm -hmm. I mean initially I was relatively relaxed about it. It was it's a medicine. It's used mm -hmm. as an anticonvulsant in some countries, used as a treatment for alcoholism in other countries. I've always thought it got quite a bit of bad press, but but we do we have seen examples of people deliberate you know, using it to to manipulate and control and sometimes with lethal consequences when it's given with alcohol so i just wondered whether you had any any of your interviewees had actually had bad experience definitely um it certainly came out in interview not only that they'd had bad experiences that they knew people who had died from it oh, that really? you know weren't wow. captured in in the data because it's not tested for yeah. in most toxicology reports as we know yeah. so certainly but lots of people talked about having bad experience where they'd mixed with alcohol or they'd done a tiny bit too much yeah. all of them had survived obviously because we we're interviewing them but um certainly they talked about becoming more and more risk averse around how mm. they used it how often they used it the context in which they used it who they used it with mm. yeah i mean i think i think the importance of set and setting was really something that all of our participants really drew upon. So they needed to be in an environment that they felt comfortable with. They needed to be in a particular mindset as well. And sort of returning to um, G, I know a lot of my participants sort of explicitly talked about GHB being the drug that they wouldn't go near. They had combined lots of different um, sex and drugs, um, but actually that was the one that they were quite fearful of. And that was often related to Stephen Port case and drug facilitated assault. Could you tell us a bit I, I, that case? I, I'm not familiar with that one. I can say a little bit. Um, yeah. So this was a case involving a gay guy who uh, was using Grinder to attract sexual partners and essentially spiking their drinks right. with G. And then uh -huh. um, he killed several men. Mm -hmm. I hope I'm right in or saying so. Accidentally, perhaps. Or, or well, no, I think deliberately. And yeah. I think that's where, you know, there is a lot of anxiety in particular about mm. the, you know the fact that there is more now more awareness that G exists people will use it in mm. that particular way but I do think you know that needs to be kept in proportion that anxiety around it needs to be kept in proportion yeah I think it's really, actually really important uh, I mean you, you've spent a lot of time talking to people who take G and thinking about G what's the best way we can reduce the possible risks Actually, our participants told us a huge amount about innovative strategies around harm reduction. Mm. You know, it's about the set and setting you're in. It's about knowing the people that you're going to take it with. It's about observers and watchers being present. I think it's, it's about managing dose and managing the context in which you're taking that dose and the amount of the, you know, so on and so forth. That's very really helpful. In fact, what I'm going to do after this is I'm going to ask you to 
work with us at Drug Science to come up with a list of <laughs> a list of, of harm reduction measures for G users. But while we're carrying on the conversation now, it, there's been a push already for it to be moved up the classification system. Mm-hmm. I just wonder whether that you think that has any impact. You think it's being illegal has any impact? Did you, was there any sense in which people cared about the classification system? What we're what we're seeing is another form of knee jerk policy reaction really to the Sanaga case, the recent Sanaga case, um, who was the serial rapist who's said to have used GHB to assault his victims. So of course this it has clear symbolic value. Um, it's it's showing that the government are trying to do something. But obviously the reality is that tightening controls around GHB is actually unlikely to do much to deter the very small group of individuals who may look to use drugs like GHB to facilitate sexual assault. Um, And as we've already touched on, alcohol is by far the bigger problem. So I think we need to ensure that our attention isn't diverted away from that. But I think we also need to think about our mistakes in drugs policy. So thinking of the new Psychoactive Drugs Act, for example, um, in 2016, that was partially a response to curing the spice problem in the UK. But actually what we saw was a range of different displacement. Um, So we saw displacement to more harmful drugs. Um, We saw displacement to more harmful market forms as well. Mm. Um, So I think that's something that we really need to be very conscious of when we think about GHB and and reclassification. I do also think that we need to learn something from history around who is being policed and who the object Mm -hmm. of policing is. I think, you know, the reality is if you reclassify G, what you're mainly going to be doing is giving gay men longer prison sentences. If we look at the poppers... Uh, the issue around policing poppers in the 1980s, our uh, wonderful RA on our project did some, um, has done some work specifically on that. I think we can take lessons from that about who ends up being policed and who ends up being subject to longer sentences. Well, no, I, I, I mean, yeah, I completely uh, agree with everything you've yeah. said. You know, this re- repeated, as you say, knee-jerk reaction, mm-hmm. increase the classification, job done. When in fact. If anything, it's going to make it worse. And, uh, and it, it's a distraction from mm-hmm. what we should be doing, which is what people who are using these dogs are doing, which is working out ways to, to, to minimise harm and, and, and reduce the risk to them. So, yeah, thanks for that. Well, we're coming to the end of our, our session. I've touched on quite a few things. Are there any other drugs which emerged that you want to share with us that some people have found interesting or useful? You haven't mentioned Viagra, which I found slightly interesting, or, because I thought that was... Is that not popular anymore? Sorry, it came up a little bit. Yeah. People talked about combining it particularly with MDMA, because MDMA is often has the effect of yeah, preventing... Well, well that's uh, the point. That was one of the things, yeah. yeah. I mean, MDMA is it's, it's a funny drug, because it does give you greater warmth and empathy, but it doesn't. Mm-hmm. it's not particularly sexually... It doesn't particularly promote activity or competence. Well, oddly, I think that's one of the surprising things that came out of the study was that lots of people said that it did exactly that. But it may, may be that they were, combi- you know, they were talking about it in combination with drugs that gave them competence. No, but I think, but, but I think also the fact is I don't think there's probably ever been a scientific study of MDMA and sexual performance because it's an illegal. You know, it's one of those mm-hmm. things we don't know much about because mm-hmm. it's very hard to research. Mm-hmm. Viagra came up a little bit and I mean one of the I guess one of the drivers for the study in the first place was there was one particular book I don't know if you're familiar with it a book called Testo Junkie by Paul Bree Preciado came out it's sort of about the the moment of the 1960s where you see the growth of the pharmaceutical industry the, the birth of the contraceptive pill and the birth of Playboy so the yeah. sex industries and the pharmaceutical yeah, industries yeah, combining yeah. in that period so one of the things that we were in, really interested in was actually how have Drugs like Viagra and actually a drug called Valisi that's recently been given FDA approval. It's the uh, new female flip Viagra. Flip in, yeah. Yeah, that's the one. Is, you know, how has this changed what we consider sex- good sexual function, yeah. what's sexually normal, and so on? And how much do illicit drugs sort of feed into that mm. debate around pharmaceutical sort of enhances for sex in general? Actually, that, I mean, that whole debate about the US licensing, we haven't licensed it here, but I, I followed that story at some length, you know, and it, it's clearly there's a great resistance from regulators for women to have fun in sex. You know, you don't, you don't want to encourage that at all. You know, no. That's a bad thing. <laughs> I think, to be honest, that is what is one of the panics around women using G, is that it is a drug that allows women to focus on their own pleasure and we don't want women to be doing that. There's no way I'm going to disagree with both of you. No. <laughs> in fact, I, I, I completely agree with you. Thank you very much for coming on. It's a fascinating topic. I'm actually also fascinated that it's women who are exploring it, not men. So congratulations. And, uh, <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank uh, you very much. Uh,
I look forward to communicating with you about harm reduction with, with G as well. I mean, that's something that is really pressing for, yes. for mm -hmm. drug science at present. So We'd be really keen. We will, we will be in touch. Thank, Thank you. Thank you both very much. Thank you so much.